So as you all know, the most recent HBO show, House of the Dragon, has hit streaming services and the internet worldwide, and has thus far been received with genuinely massive praise. So for myself, I actually thought of going back to read the book that inspired this show, Fire and Blood, a prequel slash history novel of Game of Thrones that covers a very good chunk of the Targaryen dynasty. Now, Fire and Blood, this one here, is actually the very first of a duology as of right now. The second book has not been published yet, and yet this one here was absolutely massively bloated. This book at around 706 pages by itself took me a few days to finish. But overall, I can very much say without a doubt that I highly recommend this book to any Game of Thrones fan, or even if you're just in the mood for dragons and fantasy. Let's talk about it. So as of right now, the first book of this duology covers seven of the Targaryen kings, from Aegon the Conqueror all the way to Aegon the Third, the Dragonbane. So here in this story we have Aegon the First, Aenys Targaryen the First, Maegor the First, also known as the Cruel, Jaehaerys the First, also known as the Conciliator, Viserys the First, Aegon the Second, and of course Aegon the Third, the Dragonbane. I honestly did not know what to expect going into this, but these kings, all of them had amazing stories to tell. And so for me, I'm actually very excited to talk about this. But not only that, but for one major detail. For you see, during this time, the Targaryens were at their strongest that they would ever be. Simply because this was the time of dragons. During these seven kings, the Targaryens were all dragon riders at one point or another. And throughout this story, you see the rise and fall of these great dragon kings, as well as the rise and fall of the dragons themselves. So all in all, this is a story of great power, but also great tragedy, as the beginnings of the fall of a dynasty. So our first king to discuss is the man himself, the man, the myth, the legend, the conqueror. Aegon Targaryen, the first of his name. I gotta tell you guys, when I first started this book, Aegon Targaryen's whole part, the Wars of Conquest, the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, the Field of Fire, everything that played out in this part of history, really plays off like an epic power fantasy, because Aegon himself was just absolutely broken. See, Aegon, when he first started off, had seven kingdoms to worry about. The North, the Iron Islands, the Stormlands, the Westerlands, the Reach, Dorne, and of course, the Vale of Arryn. He took it upon himself to unite all these kingdoms under one rule, his own. And he took his three dragons of Beleriand, Vagar, and Maraxes, and his two sister wives of Visenya and Rhaenys, and set out to do just that. Unite the Seven Kingdoms into one. And I gotta tell you guys, reading about some of the epic fights and battles and just massacres that occurred under Aegon's reign itself was insane. You have the Field of Fire, where the Gardener Kings of the Reach are completely exterminated before House Tyrell surrenders and thus is granted lordship over the entire region of the Reach. You have House Lannister surrendering their kingship, you have Torin Stark, the king who knelt, and of course you have Argalak the Arrogant facing off against Ori's Baratheon in the Stormlands. And like I mentioned before, throughout this entire book there are these many very well done illustrations done by Doug Wheatley that gives you an idea of just what is going on here. These are very fantastic black and white illustrations, and one of them in fact was Ori's Baratheon confronting Argalak the Arrogant, the last of the Storm Kings. Now essentially Aegon is described as an enigma throughout his entire reign. The man reigned for about 37 years before his death, 
And I gotta tell you, this man did not go without tragedy. As a matter of fact, when he tried to take Dorne, at one point, he actually lost one of his sister wives, Rhaenys, as well as the dragon Meraxes, to Dorne. They tried to take Dorne, and in the process, they lost Rhaenys and Meraxes. And from that, Aegon swore vengeance upon Dorne, before being forced to recall after receiving a letter from the Princess of Dorne, Maria Martell. Whatever it was, the letter was never told of what was contained there, for all we know is that Aegon himself had his hand shaking so violently that he had blood spilling from his palms. Lord knows what Maria Martell said to this guy, but I have a feeling it really pissed him off. But in the end, I will say Aegon did do his job very well, but at the same time, the leftovers afterwards, his immediate sons caused a lot of issues. Speaking of whom... Okay, let's talk about these two. Let's talk about Aenys the First and Maegor the First. The reason why I'm putting these two together is because they are both immediate blood brothers, except from different mothers, but also the fact that, essentially, both of their reigns were very brief, but also had a lot of blood from one way or another. For instance, Aenys inherited a realm that was somewhat peaceful, but also still very much divided. The fact that he did not have the force of will to impose himself upon the Seven Kingdoms, whom at this time were simmering about wanting to go back to the old ways, especially after Aenys ascended the throne. That definitely sends a lot of bad messages here. Now, Aenys at first is described as very skinny, but also very weak-willed. He tries to please people, or at least tries to play the politician or the Good Samaritan. However, being a good person, especially when your reign has just started, especially when you're the newest king on a recently acquired throne, with a massive continent that is still simmering about wanting to go back to the way things were, you're generally going to fail. Especially when you try to keep to the old ways, try to wed your son and daughter together, whilst disregarding the faith of the Seven. And if history has taught us anything here in real life, you do not piss off the church, or they will execute you with religious fervor. And that is exactly what they did with Aenys. The Faith of the Seven, as well as the Faith Militant, tried to usurp Rhaenys essentially because of his acts of abomination. Now, the Faith of the Seven had tolerated Aegon's marriage to... Visenya and Rhaenys because they viewed it as him honoring his Valyrian heritage, plus he was a brand new king, so they granted him that moment. They were willing to turn the other way. But with Aenys immediately trying to follow the custom of wedding his son and daughter together, the Faith immediately said, Nope! Depose this abomination, damn it! And they about nearly killed him. Were it not for the fact that a royal member of the King's Guard defended Aenys' family, they all would have died that day, plain and simple, and Aenys was forced to retreat to Dragonstone. However, when he learned that his son Aegon and his daughter Reyna were both held captive in the Westerlands, he immediately fell ill. Now, first the maesters tried to take care of him, but then his... Visenya, Queen Visenya, tried to step in and help him out. But he apparently soon died of sickness straight afterwards. Thus, we enter to Magor. Oh god, where do I begin with Magor? I'm just gonna say this, the man was a freaking mess of a king. As the immediate son of Visenya and Aegon, Magor definitely stands out as a hardened warrior, as you can tell just from his physical visage here. Now, when Magor took over the throne, he essentially told the immediate sons and children of Aenys, Y'all ain't having this. This'll be my throne now. I'm stepping in because you all are too weak to defend this right now. So he steps in with his mother Visenya as his greatest supporter, challenges the Faith Militant to a trial by seven, where he and six other warriors faced off against seven members of the Faith Militant. By the end of it, Magor himself stood alone, 
among the bodies of multiple other people, about 13 people. However, Magor himself was not without injury, as apparently he took a massive blow to the head, which had his brain ringing in his skull. And I think that honestly might have influenced some of his decisions later on. But lo and behold, they were messed up. Magor is not known as the cruel for nothing. Essentially, the whole thing was Magor himself went on a freaking bloody campaign against the Faith Militant and the Faith of the Seven. See, at one point, he actually mounts Beleriand, the Black Dread, his father's dragon, and burns down the Sept of Remembrance while the Faith Militant are inside at morning prayer. The whole city of King's Landing could be said to hear the screams for miles of burning people. Yeesh! It was bloody. Not only this, but he actually had to deal with his nephew, Aegon the Uncrowned, challenging Magor's rule because, by all the laws, Aegon the Uncrowned was meant to be the successor of the Iron Throne, not Magor. How does Magor respond to this? By confronting Aegon above the god's eye and killing his own nephew. Yikes. Not to mention other things, Magor at this point tried to install his own line to take the throne. However, each woman he married, and this man married up to eight different women to try to secure his own future heirs. None of them succeeded. In fact, most of the time, he either had miscarriages or nasty abominations that were birthed. It was only later on that he found out that one of his lovers, Tiana, was in fact poisoning his wives for some god knows what reason. And throughout all of this, we see how Magor has a very nasty thing for beheading. But also, one of the biggest historical monuments of this time was in fact the Red Keep of Westeros, the Red Keep of King's Landing, was finally completed during Magor's time. And what does he do? He throws a feast for all the workers, and then after everyone's good and drunk, he executes them all to keep the secrets of the Red Keep for himself. Smart move, if a bit messy, but Magor was just the worst. In the end, everyone else was turning against him after his great a nephew, Jaehaerys the Conciliator. Everyone was rallying to Jaehaerys. And by this time, Mago realized that he was essentially by himself. He mounted a war council, and he was left alone for the night, brooding on the Iron Throne. He was found the next day, with both of his wrists slit, and a blade of the Iron Throne stabbed through his neck. Whether it was suicide or an assassination attempt, nobody really knows. Me, personally, I kind of feel like it was the suicide route, because at that point, you do not have a child of your own to secure your family line, and you are essentially by yourself and surrounded on all sides. You have no other option but the coward's way out. And that is exactly what I believe Magor did. Now, let's move on to my personal favorite of the Targaryen kings. And here we have my personal favorite of the old Targaryen kings, Jaehaerys the First Targaryen, known as the Conciliator, but also the Old King. Now the second moniker he actually earned because Jaehaerys himself was the longest Targaryen king to have reigned on the Iron Throne, reigning for a good 55 years. And when he finally passed away, every single corner of Westeros from the north all the way to even Dorne, which at this time was still a separate power from the Iron Throne. Every per man, woman, and child mourned the loss of such a great king. And not without cause. Jaehaerys himself inherited a very fractured and very bitter realm from Magor I. But during his reign, he not only had to deal with with plagues and the occasional uprising, but also the good old-fashioned family drama. But during this time, he actually managed to establish peace across the entire w realm of Westeros and a great amount of prosperity, especially with his establishment of the great network of roads across Westeros, from the King's Road to
to the Rose Road, to the Gold Road, the River Road, all of them. He built all of them because he literally looked at his small council and said, Gentlemen, I want roads. Now, to harbor back to the plagues. See, during this time, Jaharis actually had to deal with a nasty winter that had a great deal of famine, but also a nasty sickness that was spreading called the Shivering Sickness, or the Shivers. And a lot of people died during this plague, including Jaharis' oldest daughter, Daenerys, which was an oddity in itself, considering that because of their bonds with dragons and because of their unique heritage, Targaryens normally did not get sick. So this was a very huge oddity. But not only this, he had to deal with the hand of the king at first, known as Rogar Baratheon, who was ruling as a regent until Jaehaerys came of age, who was getting a little bit too big for his britches, and was essentially trying to order Jaehaerys around, especially when Jaehaerys and his sister, the good Queen Alison, in decided to marry each other, despite the past issues that we had with Targaryens trying to keep their old customs with the Faith of the Seven still around. Because of this, he had to essentially exile himself to Dragonstone for a few years, despite the fact that Rogar kept trying to break up the marriage. And, but eventually, Jaehaerys actually found a peaceful solution to this. He described seven people to go out and preach the matter of exceptionalism, because he came up with the simplest solution possible for the Faith of the Seven. See, the Faith of the Seven does have this whole thing, and they agree that marrying brother to sister is an abomination. However, Jaehaerys proposed this simple idea. The Targaryens were different. They were not native to Westeros. They were, in fact, outsiders. They were from Valyria, where they had a unique blood type. They had a unique way of doing things, a unique culture. Marrying brother to sister or marrying within the family was normal for them. Because of this, Targaryens were generally seen as outsiders, but also as huge members of Westeros. But they were just different. Because of this, Jaehaerys was actually able to establish peace with the Faith of the Seven, as well as also lead to the disbanding of the Faith Militant by pledging that the Crown would always serve the Faith and protect it. Like I said, this man was exceptional with wisdom as well as negotiation. But to hark back to the family drama, he had to deal with a sister of his, Rayla, I will get to her in a bit, and her tragedy. Not only this, but he had to deal with a few rambunctious daughters. Essentially, one daughter, Sierra, actually was being frisky with the boys a lot, and at one point, she was actually courting three different men at one time. Now, Jaehaerys at first would have probably let this slide maybe, but he also was really not happy with her, especially when she made the biggest mistake and opened her mouth and essentially said, well, I could just marry all three of them like Magor did. And that is one thing you never want to say to Jaehaerys. Magor is a big no-no among the family, and Jaehaerys himself was royally pissed. He exiled Sierra to Old Town at the Citadel to essentially learn from the faith, as well as learn how to be a little better. Now, it might have been his temper would have cooled if his daughter Sayra had not essentially left Westeros altogether and went to the free city of Lys and became a prostitute. When good Queen Alicent found out about this, that their daughter had just become a whore, Jaehaerys says one of the coldest lines ever. She always was. And that is just a cold thing to say, essentially saying, my daughter is dead to me. Now, a second daughter was essentially running around right before marriage, got completely drunk, and broke their skull open whilst horse riding through King's Landing. Yikes. Not only this, but a lot of Jaehaerys' immediate successors, Aemon 
as well as Balon, were killed in one way or another. Aemon actually was killed during the time when they were dealing with, essentially, pirates off of the coast of Westeros, and he actually took a poisoned scorpion bolt through the throat. Ay. As for Balon, Balon would have been the immediate successor, but unfortunately he died ahead of a burst appendix. So Jaehaerys' reign was ruled with complication, with tragedies, family drama, peace and prosperity, all rolled into one. But the biggest subplot occurred with his more immediate family, especially his oldest sister. So, let's talk about Rhaena Targaryen. I'm going to say this now, Rhaena's life was definitely a freaking tragedy all the way throughout, and her story definitely made an interesting, if very tragic, subplot during Jaehaerys' part of the book. And just, honestly, you cannot help but feel for this woman going through the whole story. Because not only was she forced to watch as her brother and husband, Aegon the Uncrowned, was killed by her uncle, Maegor the Cruel, but she was forced to marry said uncle, become one of his eight black brides, as he tried to establish a new heir to his stolen throne. But during this time, after Maegor was finally killed, and her younger brother, Jaehaerys, took the throne, she essentially retreated to the west with House Farman, where there she stayed, and essentially actually married Andro Farman, the second son of Lord Farman, whom she essentially married because he was kind to her. Throughout all of this, she had two daughters, Rayla, who became a member of the Faith, and Arya Targaryen, and we will get back to her in a minute. But I'm just going to say this, Rayla's life was not the greatest. And at one point, just the worst part was when she was on Dragonstone, with her husband Andro, and all of her lady friends. Let's just say this, Rayla was not the greatest wife to Andro. Andro, when he first started off, was a young and handsome guy, but due to his addiction to alcohol, he rapidly put on a few pounds. And quite frankly, going throughout his life, you could see that Rayla just did not really care for him that much. There wasn't a whole lot of love there to begin with, but over the course of their marriage, it literally came to the point where these two just could not stand each other. They had arguments, they had fights, and in fact, Rayla actually seemed, Raina actually seemed closer to all of her female companions than she ever did to Andro. Which kind of sends a few alarm bells, if you ask me, but then again, I don't blame her, considering some of the guys that she was with before this. Just, oh god. Andro, seeing all this, he actually gets jealous and winds up causing a massive poison spread throughout the castle of Dragonstone and essentially targeting all of Reyna's female friends until eventually everyone finds out that it is Andro who's doing it by using the famous poison, the Tears of Lease. And the final straw between these two was in fact when... Raina was crying over the body of one of her friends, and Andrew looks at her, a woman in grief, and says, Would you weep for me like you do for her? Only to get a backhand to the face for that, which I will admit, the guy had that coming for that asshole remark. But to poison your wife's friends out of jealousy, just yikes. Then again, their marriage was not the greatest to begin with. And in fact, when they finally find Andro, when they finally figure out that he is the, the culprit behind all these murders, behind the poisoning, what does he do? To avoid punishment, he throws himself from the tower where the painted table is located and falls on one of the sharp rocks of Dragonstone to die. Just after this, Reyna had no choice but to leave and essentially she went off to Harrenhal but during this time her daughter Arya whom she tried to keep a firm grasp on she actually had disappeared 
During this time, she had disappeared on the back of Balerion the Black Dread and had gone missing for a while. So the whole poisoning, murder, mystery that happened occurred while her daughter, Aria, was missing. Yikes. So after everything happened, Reyna essentially exiled herself to Harrenhal, where she lived out the rest of her days there, because she would not be haunted by ghosts from either King's Landing or Dragonstone. During this time, she would eventually keep on visiting Rayla, just to kind of, I guess, keep her sanity in a way, because in the end, she died alone by herself. Possibly at peace, but I don't really know. But this woman's life was definitely a tragedy. But at least it didn't end as horrifyingly as Arya Targaryen. And the fate of Arya... I actually want to borrow a quote from the book. So, to quote. It has been three days since the princess perished, and I have not slept. I do not know that I shall ever sleep again. The mother is merciful, I have always believed, and the father above judges each man justly. But there was no mercy and no justice in what befell our poor princess. How could the gods be so blind or so uncaring as to permit such horror? Or is it possible that there are other deities in this universe, monstrous evil gods, such as the priests of Red Relore preach against, against whose malice the kings of men and the gods of men are not but flies? I do not know. I do not want to know. If this makes me a faithless septum, so be it. Grand Maester Benefer and I have agreed to tell no one all of what we saw and experienced in his chambers as that poor child lay dying. Not the king, nor the queen, nor her mother, nor even the archmaesters of the citadel. But the memories will not leave me, so I shall set them down here. Mayhaps by the time they are found and read, men will have gained a better understanding of such evils. We have told the world that Princess Arya died of a fever, and that is broadly true. But it was a fever such as I have never seen before, and hope never to see again. The girl was burning. Her skin was flushed and red, and when I laid my hand upon her brow to learn how hot she was, it was as if I had thrust it into a pot of boiling oil. There was scarce an ounce of flesh upon her bones, so gaunt and starved did she appear. But we could observe certain swellings inside her, as her skin bulged out and then sunk down again, as if, no, not as if, for this was the truth of it, there were things inside her, living things, moving and twisting, mayhap searching for a way out, and giving her such pain that even the milk of the poppy gave her no surcease. We told the king, as we must surely tell her mother, that Arya never spoke, but that is a lie. I pray that I shall soon forget some of the things she whispered through her cracked and bleeding lips. I cannot forget how oft she begged for death. All the maester's arts were powerless against her fever, if indeed we can call such a horror by such a commonplace in the haven. The simplest way to say it is that the poor child was cooking from within. Her flesh grew darker and darker, and then began to crack, until her skin resembled nothing so much, seven save me, as pork cracklings. Thin tendrils of smoke issued from her mouth, her nose, even, most obscenely, from her nether lips. By then she had ceased to speak, though the things within her continued to move. Her very eyes cooked within her skull and finally burst, like two eggs left in a pot of boiling water for too long. I thought that was the most hideous thing that I should ever see, but I was quickly disabused of the notion, for a worse horror was awaiting me. That came when Benefer and I lowered the poor child into a tub and covered her with ice. The shock of that immersion stopped her heart at once, I tell myself. If so, that was a mercy, for that was when the things inside her came out. The things. Mother of mercy, I do not know how to speak of them. They were worms with faces, snakes with hands, twisting, slimy, unspeakable things that seemed to writhe and pulse and squirm as they came bursting from her flesh. Some were no bigger than my little finger, but one at least was as long as my arm. Oh, warrior, protect me, the sounds they made! They died, though. I must remember that, cling to that, 
Whatever they might have been, they were creatures of heat and fire, and they did not love the ice, oh no. One after another they thrashed and writhed and died before my eyes, thank the seven. I will not presume to give them names. They were horrors. End quote. Now, let's move on from Jeheres the first to Viserys the first, the grandson of Jeheres and the one to inherit the throne after the Great Council of 101 AC. Now, Viserys, I will say this, he definitely inherited a peaceful and prosperous realm from Jeheres, and his primary goal was to continue that peace. And for the most part, he did. However, the main problem stems that he was not able to keep peace within his own house. See, Viserys' reign is commonly coined as the apex of Targaryen power. But it was during this time that there were numerous Targaryen princes, princesses, and so many other members of the family. Not only that, but they had so many dragons during this time. But it was during Viserys' reign that the seeds for the civil war known as the Dance of the Dragons were planted. As you can see here by the banners to his left and right. But Viserys himself was not a bad king, I want to say. He was a good man, but he definitely had a troubled place as a king. Oh sure, he had a peaceful reign throughout the whole rest of it, but right after he died, civil war happened to see who would inherit the throne from him, especially concerning some of his decisions. So first, to start off with, Viserys' reign, you could say, was probably the most fun. If you were to compare him to any other king in history, you could probably call him the Robert Baratheon of the Targaryen kings. Definitely the most fun, the one who hosted feasts and tourneys and balls, and essentially he was definitely the most open-handed and one of the most kindest Targaryen kings, as well as the one who just wanted everybody to just get along in order to keep the peace that his grandfather had established throughout his long reign. So Viserys was essentially the party boy of the Targaryen kings. However, however, right after Viserys died, the parties would end for good. Because at this time, the realm was plunged into a nasty civil war between King Aegon II and Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen. For you see, during this time, Viserys had actually chosen his daughter, Rhaenyra, as the chosen heir to the throne. Like, after he dies, she was meant to inherit the throne as the new queen of Westeros. However, from the old Greek council of 101 AC, usually women are passed over for the male heir. So essentially, you have the civil war between King Aegon II and his main supporters being his mother, Queen Alicent, and his grandfather, Otto Hightower, the Hand of the King, as well as many others that I will not go into at this time. But on Rhaenyra's side, she has her uncle and future husband, Daemon Targaryen, as well as Corlys Velaryon, the Sea Snake. So as you can see, these are some of the just the major players in the Blacks and Greens. Now, Damon himself, I actually like him as a character because the way he's shown in House of the Dragon, but also throughout the book, you get the sense that he's more of a wild card, essentially. See, Damon himself had coveted the Iron Throne for a while as the second son. But at one point, he was actually the commander of the City Watch, hence earning the name Lord Fleabottom. But also, Damon was shown to be one of the most dangerous men in Westeros at this time. But you see, during his time as commander, Damon actually came up with the idea of the Gold Cloaks, hence giving the City Watch their nickname of Gold Cloaks. So you could see that Rhaenyra definitely had a lot of powerful players in her corner, but it was the same thing with Aegon II, with House Hightower being his main backing. Now, I will not go too in-depth of the Dance of the Dragons, simply because for those who are fans of the show and have not read Fire and Blood already, I don't want to provide spoilers and be 
having them blow up in my comment section saying, You spoiled the ending for us. I'm not going to do that. But I will say, during the time I was reading the part in the book that concerns the Dance of the Dragons, I was absolutely enthralled at the sheer scale of this war. Because despite the fact that it was so brief, the sheer climactic battles that occurred of dragon fighting dragon, Targaryen fighting Targaryen, all of whom wanting the Iron Throne for one reason or another. Just, I cannot wait to see people's reactions with the further seasons of the show because you will all be in for a massive cinematic treat. And I hope to God you all will not regret it. But for those of you who know how who knows how this ends, you know that it can only be a tragedy. Because this signifies the fall of House Targaryen. By the end of this war, nobody really won this thing. I will say that much at the very least. But for now, let's move on from the Dance of the Dragons and move on to our final king, Aegon III. So to first begin, this book does not cover the entire reign of Aegon III. It in fact covers a time known as the Reign of the Regents, because Aegon actually inherited the throne when he was just a child. But because he could not be trusted to rule the realm as a child, he essentially had to watch the Reign of the Regents, as it was called. And I'm just going to say this, Aegon III was a broken man, to put it simply. See, he inherited the throne after Aegon II was poisoned, because nobody trusted Aegon to actually rule the realm peacefully, as well as it was a way to kind of end the Dance of the Dragons, in a way just to make sure that nothing would prolong the war. So Aegon actually had to inherit the throne at a very young age, but because he could not be trusted to rule, he was essentially had to appoint a council of regents to rule in his stead until he came of age at 16. And I will say this much. The reign of the regents was definitely an interesting piece of Game of Thrones history. Because during this time, Aegon was a very somber person. Because he was forced to watch the death of his mother, which I will not say how, because that would be spoiling. Unless you've seen the books, then you know what the heck happens to him. Not only this, but Aegon had a massive fear of dragons. Like, he is known as the Dragon Bane for a reason, because during his reign, the dragons essentially die out. But not only this, but Aegon was just a very glum person in general, very quiet, very serious. But during this time, he not only had to deal with a massive sickness that spread throughout the realm, but also he had to deal with Dalton Greyjoy, the Red Kraken, causing massive mayhem on the western shores of Westeros and assaulting House Lannister at every turn. But there was some good news that occurred to help alleviate him. His brother, Viserys, was actually found, and Aegon had for a while carried the guilt that he had abandoned his little brother to death, only to discover that his brother Viserys was alive and well and actually married to someone from Lys. Essentially, a daughter of the head of House Rogar. And in fact, there is actually a period in time in Westerosi history known as the Lysini Spring, where members of House Rogar of Lys were populating throughout King's Landing like freaking rabbits. Not only this, but Aegon, essentially, he was just a very glum person, to put it simply. But I do think that he was kind of a dick when he reached 16. Because when he finally reached 16, he had a member of House Manderley acting as Hand of the King, and they had planned things to kind of send Aegon out on a royal progress, to essentially kind of reestablish connections with him with the rest of his people, get him out of the Red Keep for a bit, and essentially just introduce him to the people, and just kind of help to establish further peace in the realm. Especially after one of the hands of the king during the realm, reign of regents, Unwin Peak, used the opportunity as his own time as hand of the king to try to bring his small house back to prominence, and he was rapidly usurped after discovering the kind of crap he was trying to pull. 
But Aegon, how he started off his reign, essentially he looked at Lord Manderley and told him, there is not going to be any royal progress. Cancel that. Cancel any celebration of my 16th name day. And I want you all to pack up your things and get the hell out of my castle. Essentially, he promises to give good food to the people and all that stuff just to rule the realm. But the way he goes about it kind of gives off that kind of standoffish kind of a dick move. Hell, Lord Manderley on his way out, he literally would refer to King Aegon as that sullen boy. And honestly, I cannot wait to see what Aegon III's reign will be in the second book whenever it does come out. Because with the way he starts off like that, not to mention his fear of dragons and how dragons essentially died out during his reign, I am curious to see what will happen in the second book with this guy. Because there was a lot that happened during just the realm of regents. But that will be covered, hopefully, with Aegon's reign in the second book. But let's move on to the score, shall we? So all in all, I have to give Fire and Blood a very solid 10 out of 10. For just in 706 pages worth, I was enthralled at reading about the history of the Targaryen dynasty, and it actually reignited my love for Game of Thrones. It reminded me of why I loved this series to begin with. It's so complex, with wars and plagues and treachery and politics. But during this time, dragons were a thing. But watching that huge fantasy element play out during the Targaryen dynasty, during at least the first half of it, was fascinating. I will say that much. Now, if you guys are interested in any of the other stuff I've covered from George, I have actually done a review of the first volume of his duology of Dream Songs. If you're interested, the link will be here for you all to see. And if you like some of the reviews that I have done thus far, there is also the playlist for book reviews on the right. But if you just like the content I provide in general, feel free to subscribe. I would also love to know what your guys' thoughts were in the comment section down below. If I did a good job, if I didn't. But I must thank you all again for listening to this crazy man's ramblings. This honestly might have been one of the longest videos I have done thus far. And I hope I can provide more quality content in the future for all of you. So once again, thank you all for listening to this crazy man's ramblings. This is Ramblin' Collector signing off, and happy reading to all of you.